gotten together with a group of people and they've called it a small group or a life group or a discipleship group. And you're going to start meeting and maybe you've met for four or five weeks and then people stop coming. Or maybe you've met with a group for, you know, several weeks and all of a sudden something happens and that group just implodes. Well, other groups, well, they started kind of organically and they've been meeting for years. What is this? What, what's happening in a, a life of a small group? We need to recognize that anytime you get a group of people together, well, they kind of create an organism of sorts. They create a, a group that can be identified as such. And, and in that system, we need to recognize that there is a potential life cycle. Now, some groups are set up that their life cycle is going to be finite. Maybe you're going to lead a group that's going to meet for six weeks or eight weeks or 12 weeks. And so you know when that group's going to start, when that group is going to end. But some groups are set up to just start and, and meet until, well, they don't want to meet anymore. And that, that may happen years and years from now. Well, what are some things that we know about the life cycle of a group that can be helpful for us as we lead out in groups? How can we set up groups for success as much as possible, whether they are going to last for 12 weeks or 12 years? Well, we know some things from group theory, and we know some things from what is called the life cycle of a group. And here's where every life cycle begins. Well, it begins by being born. And so every group starts in some way. And so we're going to call that first stage, the orientation stage. That first time that you get a group of people together, that's a really important time together. Because in that meeting, you are setting up the standards by which that group is going to continue to meet. It's in this time that recognize, especially if people don't know each other, they might be really, really nervous, looking for ways that they connect with others. They may be coming in going, do I even want to be a part of this group? Am I going to fit in? And you, as a leader, may be very nervous about, can I lead this group? And so on the orientation day, you need to be thinking about how can you help everyone feel comfortable? How can you also demonstrate to the group how this group is going to meet from week after week after week? And so on that first meeting, in that first meeting, there are some things that will be really helpful for you to establish. First of all, establish you're going to start on time and you're going to end on time. That helps create a, a rhythm that everyone can trust. Other things that you want to talk about is, okay, maybe in the first meeting you're not going to do the same kinds of things you're going to do in weeks after that, but you'll want to establish what are you going to do? Are you going to study the Bible together? Together, uh, over certain texts? Are you going to choose that? Is, is everybody going to participate in that? Are they going to read ahead? What's the expectation before the next meeting together? As well as other things like, is there going to be food? And if so, who's going to provide it? Um, are we going to meet in the same space week after week after week? In that orientation meeting, you want to make sure that you answer as many questions as possible for the people that are going to be participating. Because in that, you're setting up your group for success. Also, in the orientation meeting, you want to make sure that you're clear about the expectations, that you're hopeful that they would, you know, show up week after week, and that they would make that a priority on their calendar. If there's other expectations that you have, you'll want to be really clear about those in that first meeting. That first meeting sets the stage for every meeting that happens after that. And so think through how do you want to set up that first gathering of people and help everyone feel connected to one another and to you and to God through that. But then recognize that that next meeting or two actually quickly moves you into the second stage of a life group cycle. This stage is called the exploration phase. It's in this meeting or two, maybe the second, third, fourth week of a group getting together, that people start to, well, they start to figure out where do I fit in in the group? Am I going to be somebody that knows uh, the things that we're going to be talking about? Am I, am I a novice at this? Am I going to be able to share my thoughts and opinions or do I need to hold back? 
Are there other people there that I feel connected to? Um, how do I feel in relationship to others? Do I feel like I'm accepted and fit in or not? Um, often in these couple of weeks, people play it a little bit safe. They maybe um, hold back if they want to share something, or maybe um, they aren't quite as argumentative if they kind of lean towards that kind of personality. Um, in these couple of weeks, it will be really helpful for you to lead well. You might have to um, think more clearly about the kinds of questions that you're gonna ask because conversation won't be quite so organic. You might need to lead a bit more strongly through the sessions, through the material that, um, that you're leading them through in terms of Bible study. But definitely during these weeks, you need to clearly follow the expectations you've set up. If you said you're going to start at seven, you need to start at seven. If you've said that we're going to spend this much time, you know, studying God's word, you need to spend that time. Because the expectations, if you meet those expectations in those first couple of weeks, you build a lot of trust with the group. They know what the expectations are. They know that they can expect to show up and, and do the things and, and if that is what they want to participate in. And so those next couple of weeks are weeks where people are exploring, do I fit in? Do I want to continue in this group? And leading through those uh, weeks will be really important but not quite as important, I'll be honest, as what we call the third phase of the life cycle group, because it's in, when you, we, when you reach about week four or so, you enter what we call the power and control stage. What we know about a group of people getting together is this. In week one, you orient them. In week twos and threes, they're figuring things out. But in week four or five, it starts to get real. People become more comfortable. And in their comfort, they can then exhibit their characteristics, their personalities a bit more strongly. And those people that come in who like to lead, well, they may want to try to lead, especially if you aren't leading well right? And they may want to exert kind of their control, or they may want to uh, try to take over discussions and conversations. They might want to steer them towards their favorite topic. It's in these weeks, starting about week four or five, you might recognize that you're feeling like maybe people are at odds a bit more. And that's okay, because here's what's happening. In this power and control phase of a life cycle in a group life is that you are building trust. If you can lead well through these weeks, you're helping everyone to feel like, okay, yes, maybe somebody is being a bit more aggressive in their conversation, but the leader, they're gonna make sure that everyone feels safe. They're gonna control that aggressive personality. Or if somebody feels like, that seems like they're taking over, they want to take over, if the leader is leading well, it builds trust even with the people that maybe feel like they should be in charge. If they can see someone else is gonna be leading well during those weeks and they can then trust, okay, I can trust you to lead and they can back off a little bit. Now, during these weeks, what you may discover is if you continue to lead well, some people, well, they may stop coming. They may have joined the group out of the wrong motives. Maybe they joined the group because they wanted to be in a situation where they could talk about their favorite topic rather than whatever study you're supposed to be talking about. Maybe they wanted to be in a situation where they can control other people. And once they realize, well, that situation is not going to be in this group, they may stop coming and that's okay, right? You're also gonna have in this period of time, some people that maybe step back a little bit and you need to, as a leader, encourage their participation. You need to um, create space where there's time for everyone to stop and to reflect and to be quiet so that those that need a bit more time of reflection can join into the conversation. Um, you might need to encourage people into the conversation as well as during this period of time, if you've got some difficult personalities, especially personalities who want to utilize a, a life group as an opportunity to just talk about their own problems, you might need to take some people aside and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with them and say, we care about you, we love you, but this is not the space for us to just talk about your problems, but rather to study the word of God together so that we can 
you know, look at all of our lives and not just yours. And, and so it's a difficult period of time, but also having been through the life cycle of a group in, in different formats, I know that once you get through this period of time, what you're going to reach is a beautiful, beautiful stage, all right? It's in this stage that we call the emergent stage. It's in this stage that the group goes from being eyes to we. It's in this stage that people start calling on one another, not just during your group time, but outside of group time. It's when you start to see yourself as a community. You start to tackle problems together. You start to reach out to one another organically and not just in the times that you have set aside for your group to meet. It's in this time that you recognize the strengths and weaknesses of the different members. And it's in this time that leaders, well, guess what? you get to step back a little bit and become a member of the group. You get to participate in the conversation and at times maybe share the leadership with others as they have demonstrated that their gifts and skills might lend themselves to that. It's in this time where you can um, you know, live life together and build a community and enjoy what we see, you know, in scripture with, you know, the 12 disciples and in other kinds of contexts where people are being the community of God together. But we recognize that that stage may not last forever. For some groups, that emergent stage can take them for weeks and weeks and weeks or even through years. Um, but also what we do know about the life cycle of a group is that at some point in time, if you don't add some new energy to the group, well, that emergent stage is going to start to decline. And so there's a couple of things that a group can do after they have been meeting for quite some time. And that is to make a change. <laughs> and it could be this, it could be as simple as adding some new members. And if you do, well, guess what? Your whole group kind of moves through that process all over again. Maybe it's that you wanna change the direction of the study of that group. Maybe you want to do something um, in a different vein of biblical studies. Maybe you wanna to move towards a service opportunity. Um, maybe you, you want to meet more frequently or less frequently. Some kind of change to bring, you know, kind of new life into this group, right? Um, and so if that might be the struggle that your group is having right now is it, it just feels like it's doing the same thing week and week and week after week, maybe you need to have a conversation about well, what is a positive change that we could bring about to this group so that we can have a new life. But also, as all things, there is a time where it comes to an end. And we don't always know how those life groups will end. Sometimes it's because, well, they're scheduled to end, that they're gonna meet for 13 weeks and they have barely gotten to the emergent stage when it's time to conclude their time together. Or uh, a leader is gonna move on or a group is you know, going to lose several people because they're moving into a new uh, time or space in their life and ministry or into a physical new space and moving away. Um, Sometimes groups terminate because there's conflict that arises, especially during the power and control stage and they end abruptly. But for those groups that have made it through the life cycle and have recognized that, you know what, maybe it's time to conclude our group meeting um, as this group, maybe it's time to move in new directions and have people join different groups. What I would encourage you to do is if you are starting to reach that time where you recognize it's time for this particular group to end, I encourage you to celebrate it, to recognize that you've journeyed through this journey together, to celebrate the things that you've done. So whether this group only meets for you know, 12, 13 weeks or for over the course of a year, or it's been meeting for years and years, stop and celebrate the things that have happened in this group. 
All of our life groups are interesting organisms. There are so many factors to consider, but this pattern hopefully will help you think about, okay, at what stage is our current life group? What are the things that I need to be doing as a leader? What are some things that maybe I'm seeing in um, the group as a whole, as well as individuals within the group? And maybe this will help me think about how I can lead well so that our groups can have um, community life together for a very long time. Congratulations on being named a life group leader, and I pray your blessing over being the community of God with those people.